Hey FPC, I'm Ben. We are so glad you decided to join us. This month, we have some awesome announcements. September 16th is our quarterly choir practice. September 19th, we have a youth call to war. Uprush, we're excited to see you there. September 29th and the 30th is our Purpose Institute classes. And September 30th is also a Dove's Tea Party. Please feel free to visit our information desk for more information. As we begin our service, we thank you for choosing to worship with us today. Let's worship.
presence and worship in the house this evening, we welcome you to First Pentecostal Church. Church, listen to these words from Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. Paul speaking says, Unto me, who am the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. <laughs> and I wonder, in this house tonight, who in this house can say with earnest sincerity, the longer that I know him, the more true this word is, the unsearchable riches of Christ, that tomorrow, no matter what is prepared for me, I know that he's already in tomorrow, and a joy that passes all understanding can be mine, because this Jesus is mine the unsearchable riches of Christ. And I don't know about you, church, but I am just so thankful to be in the house one more time so that we can do our best to seek him and learn more of these unsearchable riches. Welcome to all of our first-time guests, both in the house and those of you that are joining us online. We pray that the word of the Lord blesses you and your home this evening. A few things coming up this week. Remember that Refresh is happening Monday at 7 p.m. And Chosen is happening Tuesday at 7 p.m. Both of these are online calls. And if you have not already signed up to participate, you can reach out to Brother Chris or Sister Amanda Kiesling. They are more than happy to get you included so that you can take part in these wonderful sessions together as we learn and grow in the kingdom of God. 2024 Bible quizzing season is upon us, or soon coming rather. Now you can stop by the information desk for a sign up, but we have two groups this year. Our junior ages are 6 to 12, and that is being overseen by Brother Philip and Sister Abby Ross. If you have any questions about what the season would entail or anything like that, you can of course see them for any inquiries that you may have. Now our senior ages are 12 to 18, and this is being overseen by Brother Rob and Sister Lynn Pollock, so you can see them for additional questions as well. And if I could ask our ushers to please make their way forward as we prepare to give unto the Lord with our tithe and offering. Remember, there are a great many ways to give. You can, of course, give as the ushers make their way through the congregation if you're in the house. If you're joining us online, you can give on the website, you can text to give, you can give through the app. There's a great many ways that you can bless and increase the kingdom of God. And church, as we prepare to give, I'm going to ask you to direct your attention to the prayer board behind me. Now, there are names represented there, and these are names that all represent needs. When is the last time that you or a family member desperately needed an answer from God, and you were so thankful to have a church body and a church family that you knew all I had to do was let the family know we were in need and they sought God on my behalf. Church, I am asking you, let's do that here tonight. Can we seek the Lord? Lord Jesus, we thank you for one more opportunity to experience your presence. We thank you for the word of God that has been prepared for us today. But Father, we are asking you to see every situation, every impossibility, oh God. Lord, there are times in our life when we do not know what to do, but we know that we can come boldly before the throne of grace and we can make our petition known unto the King of kings and to the Lord of lords. So Jesus, we are asking you to hear, to answer, and to move on behalf of your people. Bless this offering and bless our time together in Jesus' name.
hand and give him a hand clap of praise? Have you found him to be faithful? Have you found Jesus to be faithful? He is faithful. He's worthy of all the praise and all the honor. Why don't you lift your voice and give him praise right now? Bless the name that is above every name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is great and greatly to be praised. Why don't you turn to two or three people right now and remind them that he is great. and He is greatly to be praised. Jesus alone is worthy of all the praise and all the honor. So wonderful to be in the house of the Lord again tonight. We rejoice in what the Lord has done already today. There were those who were baptized and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost this morning. I say that's worthy of praise. The work of the gospel. I'm so thankful the gospel still works. And what a powerful message we heard from Pastor this morning. And I believe a lot of people had a new day today. It started today, a fresh start, and uh, we are thankful for what the Lord is doing. It is a blessing to have with us tonight. Sister Bianca Baptiste, it's so good to have you, and uh, we bless you. She has been teaching, preaching, praying with our young people this week, has been a tremendous blessing to them and to this church. She is a prayer warrior. She is anointed of the Lord. She is, she's just returned from Spain, but she's an aimer uh, to Spain. She will be going back, we believe, soon. And uh, she's doing the work of the Lord. She is anointed, an anointed vessel. And I believe tonight she wants to share with us yet another word from the Lord for this hour, for this church. So why don't you receive Sister Baptiste right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. It is an honor to be with you guys here again tonight. This is truly a wonderful church. You guys have blessed me. Your young people have blessed me. Every time that I come, I am truly strengthened. I know everybody's been a little concerned because I just got back from Barcelona, but my Lord, it's been a wonderful time in the Holy Ghost. And so I just, I'm not going to be long. Your pastor, my goodness, this morning just tore it up. (laughs) If you did not hear the message, you need to go back and hear it. You guys are blessed. I give honor to Pastor um, and Sister Kinsey and Brother and Sister Strobel and um, just Brother and Sister Levins and all of your leadership. You guys are blessed and have just a tremendous church, and it's an honor just to be a part of the kingdom with you all. Um, I won't have you stand too long, but Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. When I was in the prayer room, again, this is the second time this has happened today. I thought I was going in one direction and then got in the prayer room and it was just like, okay, I guess I was wrong. (laughs) And so I kind of felt a shifting in gears and I felt like this is a will of the Lord. So Galatians 6 verse 9, it says, and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Praise the Lord. You may be seated, but you're going to be standing up really soon. So just a heads up. Um, That word weary literally means to be utterly spiritless, to be wearied out, to be exhausted. The Lord kind of impressed upon my spirit. There are a few of you here that have been weary. Um, There is a harvest that you guys are going to continue to reap. And I believe that there's just more to come. I'm excited for what the Lord is doing. I feel like I've said it every time that I've gotten the mic that you guys are entering into new territory. You guys are gaining greater ground. But we cannot afford for you to do this weary. And so if you have been dealing with the spirit of weariness, if there's been any kind of weariness in your spirit, it's going to break tonight. And so the reason why that I said you're going to stand up again is because if you, the Lord has just spoken to me, I'm going to be very quick, but if you have been dealing with the spirit of weariness that you have been just, just worn out, you can't explain it. You get rest, but you get up still fatigued. You go to do the things of God and you're still worn out in your spirit. It's God's will that that breaks tonight. So I'm going to ask you to stand one more time. I told you, you guys are going to sit and stand really quick. 
Something that's interesting that I saw in Galatians 6 verse 9, it said, 9 as well, it says, and in due season we shall reap. That word due literally means pertaining to oneself, one's own um, belonging to oneself. This reaping that's going to take place is not, this is going to be for the church collectively, but there's a reaping that's going to take place in your personal life for those that have been faithful, that you've been sowing, and God has seen it, but again, we can't afford for you to be worn out and faint before it's time to reap. So if you have, if this is, if I'm talking to you and you have been dealing with weariness in your spirit, I want you to come up. Okay, if you're not, that's fine. You're going to be part, you're going to participate here in a little while as well. And I don't want you to be embarrassed. You are doing this because you've been working for the kingdom (laughs) and the enemy sees it. But like I said, I feel in my spirit, it breaks tonight. So in Jesus name, for those that are making your way up, feel free to make your way up. Those that have not been dealing with it, I just want you to stretch forth your hands unto these people. These are laborers that God cannot afford to be wore out and faint before the time to reap. And so in Jesus name, I just want you to lift your hands right now by the authority of the word of God and power that lies in your name. I take dominion and authority over every spirit of weariness. I command you to loose every worker here. I command you to loose this church. I bind you in Jesus' name. I loose a refreshing the flow into every heart and every mind that's standing here. I command you to be strengthened now. I command you to be renewed now. I command you to be restored now. Fresh faith, fresh anointing, fresh strength. In Jesus' name, be whole. In Jesus' name, be strengthened. In Jesus' name. name of Jesus. I want you to reach over and connect with somebody and begin to pray with them right now. That weariness is going to melt off of you and the strength of God is going to be poured into your spirit like a well of living water springing up into everlasting life. You're going, the Bible says, as your days, so shall your strength be. As your days, so shall your strength be. That being said, then there is strength in this place that in the midst of your day of trouble, in the midst of your day of trial, in the midst of your day, there is going to be strength for that day. In the midst of that day, and God is going to lift this weariness and give you a hope that tomorrow is going to be a brighter day. But the strength will come today, not tomorrow, today, right now. As your days, so shall your strength be. As your days, so shall your strength be. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Go back to your seat clapping. Go back to your seat and let God bless you tonight. Amen. Thank you, Sister Bianca, for being a part of First Pentecostal Church. Your praying, your intensity, your passion is so vital and appreciated, and thank you for accepting the call to go to Spain as an aimer to help missionaries there accomplish their mission for Christ. 
And did not Brother Vladimir and Brother Mike Herbst do such a wonderful job Wednesday night? That was awesome. God bless you. You may be seated. The first book that I read when I was just a teenager that was a religious book other than the Bible was a book called Pilgrim's Progress written by John Bunyan. I found it in stored in some uh, cardboard box in some forsaken room of the old church on 6th Street in Lake Charles. It was one of them illustrated ones. As a matter of fact, it was published in, I believe, 1678, 1688, somewhere around there, and the illustrated, I think, came out in 1813 or 15. I don't know uh, Obviously, this was a pretty old book because it was probably in Brother Evans' old library. And I picked it up and I began to read it. And this was God's beginning and his way to set me on a path for a daily devotion of meeting with him every day to receive that strength every day to help eliminate that weariness so that you can continue your fight and win victory in the midst of your struggle. I, I urge you to consider starting a daily devotion. And you can start when you get home. You don't even have to wait till tomorrow. You can do this before you go to bed tonight. You can start and then pick it up tomorrow and be intentional about doing this every day. And that's what was taught me. That's what I want to share with you tonight, a story from Pilgrim's Progress. It is so powerful in what this daily devotion is designed to do and whether or not it's accomplishing what, it, what we want it to accomplish. The life change and transformation that needs to take place in that time when you spend with God. Not waiting till you get to church to hear just the preacher preach and straighten up all your problems and get you in a good mood because you've been in a bad mood all week. I want you to be able to go to God in prayer and get out of your bad mood into your good mood and just be in one every day. You say that's not possible if you'll do a daily devotion. It is. Smile. <laughs> you know it's the truth. It is indeed. And so I want to turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10. And very simply, the story of pilgrim was he left the city of destruction when he heard about the gospel and about the celestial city and he began his journey and all the people that he met on the way those that resisted him and fought him and those that assisted him and helped him on his journey he had both and so will you in your walk with God you're going to have those that resist you both human and demonic and you're going to have the assistance of God's people and angelic beings and spirit beings that will come alongside you and give you the ability to overcome whatever it is that you are facing. Hebrews 11 and 10 was Abraham's motivation, created his passion to go through his trials. Even his own dysfunction had to be overcome. That's the reason why I want you to do your daily devotion is because we cannot overcome all your personal dysfunction in church. And I don't know if you realize it, but the Holy Ghost don't fix everything on the first night. Doesn't fix all your problems and doesn't fix all your dysfunction in a single night. Some of you have been around for a long time and it still isn't fixed. You're still working on it. Thank God he's not finished with you yet. And I'm gonna tell you how long you're gonna work on it. Just, just to give you an idea. Just to give you an idea. I don't want you to be discouraged for the rest of your aggravating life. There will never come a time you're not working on yourself. My, my thing is, is if I can get you to work on yourself and quit pointing your finger at everybody else, I can change you forever. Thank you for that resounding response. You made me feel so much at home like I'm at First Pentecostal Church. I thought I was, I thought I was at camp meeting this morning. Oh, I'm back home now. Okay. <laughs> Here's his motivation for he looked for a city which hath foundations 
whose builder and maker is God. In John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Pilgrim is at a place called Palace Beautiful. This is one of the first places that he comes to after he leaves the city of destruction. The Palace Beautiful is a type of the church of where we go to be refreshed and to strengthen so we can continue our journey. And he had a very interesting conversation with one of the sisters in the Palace Beautiful by the name of Prudence. And he confessed to her that there were times that he still wanted to go back to the city of destruction. It was the place that he had come from and there were still imaginations and delights that he longed for and he sometimes hated the battle that he had to fight and the lions that he had to face and the things that he had to overcome. And every once in a while, he felt the tug of the old world on his heart and he wanted to go back. And he almost found himself longing to go back, which was his old life. And he said that at other times, he was able to completely throw it off, completely overcome it and desire to do one thing, continue his journey toward the celestial city. And when he was able to resist those thoughts and those secret places of his heart where he longed for the delights of the city of destruction, but when he was able to overcome it, he called it the golden hours. That's what I want your daily devotion to become. I want it to become the golden hours. And so Prudence was intrigued by this, and she said, well, what By what means do you vanquish these temptations to go back to the city of destruction? What is it about these golden hours that God would visit you in such a way that it would dispel these doubts, it would dispel these desires, and you were able to retain your passion for the celestial city? How do you do that? And so he answered her. He said, when I think of what I saw at the cross... There's certainly no mistake in Bunyan's meaning here because the cross is that interlocking rendezvous of all the universe. For here's what the story says, and I quote, So I saw in my dream that just as Christian came up with the cross, his burden loosed from off his shoulders and fell from off his back and began to tumble and so continued to do till it came to the mouth of the sepulcher where it fell in, and I saw it no more. And then the pilgrim said, when I saw that in the dream, the Lord has given me rest by his sorrows and he has given me life by his death. And I believe that it's at the cross that you can ease your burden. It's at the cross you can look as he did and he wept and he wept until all of the enticements of evil and sin had completely been washed out of him and the temptations were as though they had never been. For it's at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. And it was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. Here's how I know whether or not you've been to the cross. Are you happy? I want to say that one more time because you didn't get it. I'm not saying you're happy about what's happening. I'm not saying you're happy because all your relationships are cool. I'm not saying you're happy because you got plenty of money in the bank. I'm saying you are happy because you've been to the cross and you've seen what Jesus did for you there. That'll change you. When preaching won't change you, the cross will. When preaching won't help you, the wounds in his body will. Go back to the cross. Salvador Dali painted a beautiful painting of the cross, called it St. John's of the Cross. It depicts everything looking in a different light of the cross. As a matter of fact, it's totally dark in the background. Before the cross is darkness, but everything in front, everything is transformed by the light that shines from the dying body of Jesus as he hangs his head and declares it is finished. And light completely reveals the landscape before him. And how many of you know that you were in complete darkness till you came to the cross? One man said, last night I had a terrible bout with my adversary, but I walked away from the encounter more than a conqueror. 
What did you do? Asked his friend. He said, I took him to a hill called Mount Calvary. And I said, hey, tempter, look at my Jesus. Even he who had seen it before was so transfixed by the picture. He, you, look at him being pushed by the crowd, jeered at from all sides. Look at his crown of thorns and watch him stagger under the awful cross. And then look at him hanging there just for me. He's bleeding. Look at the blood that flows from open and wounds torn and dying from my soul there that's how he loves me oh how he loves you and me he gave himself for me and then he was so transfixed he forgot to even look at the tempter that was supposed to be beside him and when he looked he was gone clean gone because he remembered the devil can't step foot on mount calvary because he can't stand the power of the blood You see, the devil doesn't like the name, does he? Because there's power in the name. Demons tremble at the sound of his name. Somebody needs to speak the name of Jesus in the house. The blood of the cross is not something that he appreciates and values. And Paul said it like this, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. If I can make it, it's like that old song that we used to sing many years ago. If I can make it to Calvary, everything's going to be all right. And there's no better place for you to do that in the golden hours of your devotion. I think everybody here ought to get disciplined. I think these young people ought to do it. Don't tell me you're too young to get a discipline. You go to school, you get your little sorry self up and go to school. Well, you can do a, a devotion. You don't have to be as sophisticated maybe as I am in my daily walk just yet. But why don't you pick up that Bible? Why don't you just call on Jesus and say, Lord, let me visit Calvary today. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. It's a golden hour. When I think of what I saw at the cross, what a golden hour. And then he said to Prudence, Prudence, something else that happens. When I look upon my broidered coat, a beautiful coat, this beautiful coat made the difference because he came to God in rags when he fled city of destruction. He did not have time because the fire was burning and everything was set on fire and he had to run for his life. And as he ran for his life, he was nothing in filthy rags. You know where Pilgrim was looking you know exactly from just looking at the pictures where he was in his journey. All you had to do was look at what he was wearing. Before Calvary, it was the dirty rags. But when he got to the cross, they took the rags away and gave him a beautiful coat. Your clothes say it for you. I love you, but the way you dress matters. The immodesty and immorality of our world are connected. I said the immodesty and the gender crisis are connected. The immodesty of our world and what people have looked at on the internet, they don't know the difference between male and female because they're no longer in divine order. But when I stand at the cross, and when I see the transformation in my life, I can rejoice and I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. Look at Cord and Lena over there shouting and praising God. What a transformation. Where's Mike Herbst? Look at the difference. He looked like them devil eyes all looking up at you, but now he's preaching the gospel. Look at a little orphan boy all the way from Russia, but he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because he was at the, it's at the cross. It's at the cross where I found my beautiful coat. You didn't get there by yourself. If you see a turtle on a fence post, you didn't get there by yourself. Somebody put you there. Thank God for the cross. Thank God for the transformation. 
that takes place. When Pilgrim first stood at the cross, the shining ones came to him. They saluted him and said, peace be unto thee. One stripped him of his rags and clothed him with a new garment. Another gave him a scroll with a seal upon it. And then they went their way. And there was Pilgrim with his broidered coat, according to the story. He began to leap for joy, kind of like what you just did. The broidered coat was therefore an emblem of the change in his life. That's the philosophy of clothes for you. Consider when Adam and Eve had sinned, what did God do? He clothed them with a covering. When Joshua stood before the Lord and the angelic beings and Satan was there to accuse him, he stood in filthy garments, and, and, but he made a mistake when the devil brought him to Jesus, brought him to the Lord God Almighty of heaven because he brought him to the one that could change his garment. <laughs> you don't do that. If you're going to accuse somebody before the Lord, you better, you better watch out because God can just say, hey, devil, turn your head. Put some beautiful, where did the filthy robe go? If God does it, the devil can't do nothing about it. And my Bible says, the joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. Hallelujah. And when you see the man from Gadara at the feet of Jesus, he was what? The Bible says he was naked in the tombs, but he was clothed and in his right mind with Jesus. The father put a new robe on the prodigal son. And so Pilgrim said to Prudence, when I look upon my beautiful coat, that'll do it. When I'm tempted to go back to the city of destruction, I think of my beautiful coat and that is a golden hour. All of our righteousness, church, is nothing but filthy rags. But we exchange those robes and those rags for a robe of righteousness. I gave him my old tattered garment, and he gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. When you look upon your beautiful coat, you're better off than you've ever been. There's one glorious statement in the scripture that proves the day of miracles is not over. The Bible says he beautifies those with salvation. He beautifies his saints with salvation. Now you just think about it, how beautiful you are tonight because you're saved. And that is a miracle. <laughs> Hallelujah, I said. I'm looking up at some of you. Y'all need to go check the mirror and said, the day of miracles is not over. God has beautified me. That's the reason why you can smile. That's the reason why you can clap your hands. It's because of Jesus. When all else fails, your faith rests on the evidence that, that it cannot fail, the evidence of the broidered coat. Remember the rags you once wore, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. What a golden hour. But prudence question further, tell me, pilgrim, tell me, what keeps you from going back to the city of destruction? He said, when I think of the cross, what a golden hour. When I look at my beautiful coat, what a golden hour. And when I look into the scroll, I carry in my heart. You don't have to stretch your imagination to figure that one out. Come on, people. We're talking about the word of God. How did Jesus defeat the devil in, in the wilderness of temptation? What, what, was it by the uh, almanac? Was it the reader's digest? Did he get on CNN and see what they said in the morning to find out what his message was going to be? He said, it is written. 
Man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus knew the word for it was in his heart. For he was the word made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus had known the scripture as a child because he was in the temple when he was just a child. And he was confounding the wise. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. That secret place for me. That shadow is the word. Don't ever do a daily devotion without both prayer. Getting into his presence and the word. They need to be together in your devotion. At least do two things. Pray and get the word. That's the secret of being forearmed. You can't just pick up a sword and run into battle. You got to learn the art of swordmanship. You got to learn how to use the word. Church, you need to learn the word. You need to speak the word. You need to live the word. We have refresh. We have chosen. We have purpose institute. We have cornerstone class. Stand up, Ed and Lisa. We've got cornerstone class. We got apostolic life. Matthew and Nicole, where are y'all? Stand up. Let everybody know where you're at. We've got Life Connect. Where's Greg and Sharon? We've got all kinds of ways you can learn the Word of God. You need to apply yourself. If you're going to do something for Jesus, you got to have the tools and the weapons to that work. Your opinion don't work. Just your ideas don't work. But prayer and worship and the word work. Learn the word. Speak the word. Live the word. You say, well, why don't people do this if it's so easy? Because it's easier to be angry and let that little, mean, sharp tongue It's easier to leave it alone than it is to fix it. Oh, did I hurt your feelings? Good. It is easier to lay down on the couch of complacency than to get yourself up and be faithful. It's easier to cling to some petty falsehood in your mind of some presumption you created in your comfort zone than to allow the scalpel of God's word to cut it out. It's easier to cleave to your cheap worldliness than it is to wear a robe of righteousness and be washed and be without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. It's easier to not be faithful and sit at home and live stream and think you're still doing the will of God than it is to believe the word that faithfulness will bless you, your family, and future generations. I'm not here at church just for myself. I don't teach the doctrine because I need to convince myself it's true, but I am preaching to a future generation that needs to know that faithfulness works. They need to know that giving works. They need to know that tithing works. They need to know that because it is better. Well, the church is always talking about money. The reason why we take offerings is to aggravate the tight wads uh, and for all the godly people to get blessed. I want the godly people to get blessed and I want to aggravate the tight wads. Woo! Some of you older people have never ever heard that. But I'll tell you now, it's a new statement that I pulled from the annals of history and I bring it today and tell you one more time, the word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee when I look into the scroll that I carry in my bosom. What a golden hour. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto death. I'm gonna sing to you, just aggravate you. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, for when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, if you'll get with me, I'll be done in just a few minutes. (laughs) So I'll sing to you just to make you, uh, I'm gonna be short like Sister Bianca. I gave her 10 minutes, she took two, praise God. (laughs) Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, for when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful. I said, God is faithful. I want to say it again. God is faithful. Who will not suffer you 
to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. And so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, church, the scroll, the word, the cross, the beautiful coat will keep you from going back. What golden hours when I think of the cross, when I think of my beautiful coat, when I read the word I carry in my heart, what a golden hour. One more thing. When my thoughts wax warm about where I'm going. Prudence asked Pilgrim, what is it that makes you so desirous to go to the celestial city and to Mount Zion? And Pilgrim said it this way. Why? I want to see him. Look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. I want to see him alive that hung dead on the cross. I love him because it took away my burden. And I want to be in his presence and his company forever. I don't worship because of where I'm at. I worship because of where I'm headed. Some of you came to church tonight with all of your creaks and your pains, but there's going to come a day, one day, one day, where the pain's going to be gone, the tears are going to be wiped away, and you're going to walk on streets of gold. <laughs> Abruptly, the interview with Prudence ends, but lingering in the air were the words, when my thoughts wax warm about where I'm going, that will do it. When I'm tempted with the city of destruction and I think of where I'm going, that will do it. When I think I'm going to a house where, where a roof doesn't leak anymore, that will do it. I'm going to a city someday which has foundations who builder and maker is God, that will do it. It's 1,500 miles in every direction. Its walls are jasper, its gates are pearl, its streets are pure gold. There's a river of life there. The Lamb of God is the light of that city. The angels are there, but not only are they there, the redeemed of the Lord are there. And time would fail me to name them all, but our loved ones are there, our friends are there, the saints of all the ages are there, and we'll know even as we are known, eternal life is there. But of all the things that are there, it also has to be remarked and has to be preached about the things that are not there. There are no more tears. There is no more crying. There is no more pain. There is no more parting. There is no more death. There's no night there for the lamb is the light of the city. There's no feeling forsaken. There's no loneliness. There's no hurting. There's no betrayals there. There's no broken covenant there. There's no secret places in people's hearts who want to go. If you ever do get there, you'll never want to leave. There's no loneliness. There's no hurting. There's no fears. There's no trouble. There's no burdens. There's no sin. There's no heartache. 
night for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them under living waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, I don't want to go back where I came from. When I think of the land to which I'm journeying, what a golden hour. It's a land where we'll never grow old. I said it's a land where we'll never grow old. I know these young people have never heard a single one of these songs, but some of you that's got some gray hairs, you don't want to admit how old you are. I can tell you sitting back, but I want you to know you remember every word of it. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. I said somebody ought to be able to shout, not because of what you're going through, but because of where I'm headed. Because what I'm going through is temporary because I'm just passing through. I'm a pilgrim on my way to a celestial city. I can see it just off in the distance. You can remain standing, the cross, the coat, the scroll, the city. Four golden hours, happy is he who is thus four times blessed and fortified with these truths like a city built four square, impregnable on every side. What golden. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Brother Evans' favorite song, they sang it at his funeral. How great. Now, when he sang it, it didn't sound like Trish singing it. But it wasn't the, it wasn't the music. It was something in his heart. He was a pioneer along with D.L. Welch in his day, in his world, preaching the oneness of God to so many people who thought he was crazy. If you want to find Jesus at the cross, if you thank him for your beautiful coat, if you look within the scroll and see his word, if you're headed for a city whose builder and maker is God, I want you to walk to the front. I want you to just walk with your hands lifted, praising God. I'm not going to ask you to leap like Pilgrim leapt when he was at the cross. Some of you might be a little too old for that. Some of us, most of us aren't, but there might be some of you. Oh, God. Would it look 
looks like I can't go any further. Rejected, forsaken, lonely, bruised, broken by people's words. Ayad Rabo Yashata. I go into my closet of prayer and it's at the cross where I first saw the light that I find the joy for it was there my burden was eased and my sin was forgiven. Thank God for the waters of baptism baptized unto his death in Jesus' name. Thank God for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. We talked about it, the unsearchable riches of Christ tonight. How rich you are. I just bring this to your attention because the number one reason why people do not seek the Lord in a daily devotion, number one reason in Pentecost. Something you wouldn't even think of. I've been reading a book studying it about the seven dimensions of man and how you go from one dimension to another. But each time you you desire to go to the next dimension, the people that's in your dimension and those below you are always trying to pull you down because now you make them uncomfortable. And the number one reason why people do not do their daily devotion is because God does start to change them by a spiritual osmosis and they don't even recognize it because you can't really see yourself. You only see the image of yourself in the mirror. You don't see yourself. I mean, you can't, I can't see myself. Y'all can see me. I see you, but you can't, I can't really see myself until I get into prayer and then I look in the mirror and I begin to see his glory and all of a sudden I'm changed into that glory, but it makes a lot of people uncomfortable around me and they don't understand it. They don't understand your need to go to the next dimension. They can't, they can't stand it because they're not there and they're not going there and they don't want to go there because they don't want to do what they have to do to get there. And they're mad at you for wanting to. And, and even if you're not doing it, if you just want to do it, they're still mad at you. And then if you start doing it and start actually going to the next level, they get even madder. Well, God help you. Praise the Lord. I'm going to the next dimension. So don't let that hinder you. You see, here's the key. Here's the point. I don't say that to call you out. I say that if we're all in the closet of prayer and we all go to the next level, then none of us have to feel uncomfortable and pull anybody down. See, that's the point. Come, come, come with me. Let's go together. Come with me to Lebanon. The bridegroom said to the bride, come with me. Let's go. And let's see what the Lord will do for us. We're going to another dimension, church. Thank God for the cross. Thank God for the beautiful coat. Thank God for the word. And I'm looking for my city, whose builder and maker is God. It is my conviction that if you don't have a vision of eternity, you will never serve God with all your heart. There are two things you need to see in your life. And God needs to show you a vision of heaven and hell. Because when you see heaven and you see hell, you will worship with a passion. Some of you have never seen it. You just look around you at the practical. All you do is see what you have to do to get through the next day. And you have no idea. This is not about now. This is about eternity. And you better get a vision of heaven. And you better get a vision of hell. Because I'm not, I don't want you to go there. That's for sure. But you gotta have both 
to understand its value of what you're doing here. It'll make you worship with a greater intensity. I've been redeemed and I'm not gonna burn in hell forever. I'm going to the city. It'll make you wanna worship so you'll convince other people around you, come go with me to the sacrifice, to the cross. Now I want you to connect with somebody and we're gonna pray together and we're gonna commit ourselves to our daily devotion but not just to go into the closet and spend time and waste time. We're going to go in there to let the presence of God bring us to the cross, look into the scroll, look upon our beautiful coat, and walk toward that city. Oh, how many saints have I been at their deathbed? And they reached up in their last words and in their last breath said, I see it. I see a city. I see the angels. I hear them singing. Speaking in tongues, leave this world because they got a vision of heaven. I want some of you elders to come pray for these young people that God will give them a vision of this. That there'll be a transfer to the new generation. I want you to come up here and I want you to pray for them. Even if you don't have children or grandchildren up here, you're still responsible for 